This week on The Anxious Truth, we're talking about journaling. Specifically, we're talking about journaling in the context of anxiety disorders and recovery from anxiety disorders. So let's get to that right now. Journaling is one of the most popular sort of default activities often connected to mental health and general wellness and for good reason because journaling isn't bad or evil but as usual things get a bit upside down when we're talking about anxiety disorders. So today we need to talk about how journaling fits into the context of chronic or disordered anxiety. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is the podcast and the YouTube channel where we talk about all things anxiety, anxiety disorders, and anxiety disorder recovery. I'm Drew Linsalata. I'm creator and host of this podcast. I'm a therapist practicing under supervision, specializing in the treatment of anxiety and anxiety disorders in the state of New York. Also a former sufferer of panic disorder, agoraphobia, OCD, depression, for many years of my life on and off, but better now, thankfully. Uh, I'm a social media guy, an advocator, an educator, and a three-time author on the topic of anxiety and anxiety disorders. Uh, yeah, today we are going to discuss journaling in the context of anxiety and anxiety recovery. But before we get to that, just a quick reminder that The Anxious Truth is more than just this YouTube video or this podcast episode. There's a ton more resources, including those books that I was talking about. There are psychoeducational and informative workshops, all at a very low cost. Uh, there's all of the free social media content. There's 301 previous free podcast episodes. Uh, take advantage of all that. All of that can be found on my website at theanxioustruth.com. Uh, if you really dig my work and want to find ways to support that, you'll also find ways to do that on my website. So again, when you get a chance, check it out, avail yourself of all the resources. That's at theanxioustruth.com. Uh, if you are here today for the first time, welcome. I hope you find what we do useful. And of course, if you're a returning viewer or listener, welcome back. I do hope you get something out of today's episode. So let's talk about journaling. Journaling is something that is widely regarded as sort of a default go-to good idea, especially in mental health and wellness circles. And I want to talk about that because while I am a fan of journaling, I am a consistent journal journaler, journaler, especially over the past two or three years. Uh, the way I journal now looks very different than the way I would have done it when I was in the thick of disordered and chronic anxiety. So we need to clarify this. Journaling isn't something that we necessarily have to abandon if we're in the middle of an anxiety disorder, but I do believe that we probably have to take a, a hard look at why we're doing it, how we're doing it, and if we can maybe modify that, at least for a while, to be in a little bit more in alignment with recovery goals that we set when we are dealing with chronic and disordered anxiety. So we're going to go over a couple of key points in this episode, and I want to start with why we journal. And I mean re, we like the royal we, not just anxious people, but people in general. What are the reasons why people like to journal and think that journaling is a good idea? Well, one reason might be to sort of keep a record of our days, uh, just sort of a historical running narrative of what we did. And sometimes it's fun or even useful in some ways to look back and remember what we did on a given day or during a, you know, a given period in our lives. And that's pretty cool. There's nothing wrong with that. But in the case of our particular context, we would have to get a little bit more specific here for the purposes of chronic and disordered anxiety recovery. Another reason why people choose to journal would be to give ourselves sort of a private or safe place to express emotions, especially things that we don't really necessarily want to share with another person. That's really excellent. Like, I'm a big fan of that in almost any context, for sure. We have to be able to express ourselves while in the state of chronic or disordered anxiety, sometimes things get a little skewed and all we keep doing is expressing the same emotion, which is fear again and again and again. We always want to have a place to productively and in a healthy way express emotions that are going to happen to every human being. It's normal and it's kind of required. So when it comes to like journaling as a way to express emotions, I'm a fan. It's really cool. Another way that people might traditionally use journaling would be to sort of work through those emotions or different ideas or problems or conflicts. So, you know, et cetera, et cetera. People will journal to sort of try to find answers inside themselves, which cool, but in this context, anxiety and anxiety disorders, I got to give you a big nope on that. And there's a reason for that. So stick with me and I will explain. Journaling as a way to find answers to our thoughts and our feelings and our experiences and our emotions while we are struggling with an anxiety disorder by being extra intentional introspective tends to be more problematic than helpful. So we were going to get to that. Let's talk about then the pitfalls of traditional journaling 
for the community of people who listen to this podcast and follow my work on social media. It's really the part where we work through feelings, emotions, thoughts, ideas, conflicts, and challenges through introspection and examining ourselves. Like in the case of anxiety and anxiety disorders, that's where things tend to sort of go off the rails for people in our community. It fuels repetitive, compulsive, ruminative habits that really cause the problem to begin with. Anxiety disorders larger, largely kind of revolve around falling into the trap of trying to use a very basic human ability, which is figuring things out mentally and cognitively. This is a trait that helps us. But in anxiety disorders, we tend to try to jam that trait and that ability into situations where it just doesn't belong. It cannot be helpful. And it actually turns out being harmful. Anxious people in general try to solve their feelings, thoughts, and bodily sensations, which is not really a thing for non-anxious people, and it starts to get us in trouble. So the record-keeping aspect of journaling in a traditional sense is also a bit of a trap for an anxious mind or somebody in the, in the grips of chronic or disordered anxiety. I mean, looking back at our days and our emotions and our experiences can be super useful or, like I said before, fun in the right context. But for an anxious mind that's in the middle of an anxiety disorder, record keeping reveals kind of a never ending, constantly looping horror story, which isn't in any way productive. This is something that you're probably doing every day, even if you're not journaling, just repeating how scary it is and what it feels like and how hard it is. This, if you do it formally in journaling, can then really encourage or lead to digging furiously for kind of clues and hints as to how to fix those feelings, those thoughts, those emotions and sensations. And that's when things really get lit on fire and we wind up perpetuating the problem. And of course, if you're new to this, you might say, whoa, like my mind is exploding right now. What is this guy saying? This is why I said in the beginning that in the case of anxiety disorders, things turn to get, tend to get turned kind of upside down or backwards. This is very counterintuitive and common sense often doesn't apply in our context. We care about that. We have to. So let's look at journaling or recording our thoughts as part of sort of cognitive behavioral therapy. But what I really care about is sort of old school CBT, the stuff that was being done in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even into the early 90s. And sadly, in some circles, is still relied on today, even though we know it's probably not a good idea. So journaling in the case of sort of traditional or old school CBT might involve things like keeping thought records. Anybody who's been through a formal course of CBT kind of using those old school traditional techniques may have been taught to keep thought records. You're recording your thoughts. What triggered it? What were you doing when you had these thoughts? In that situation, you're doing it to look for triggers often so they can be avoided or managed. And that is the opposite of acceptance and psychological flexibility, which are really the cornerstones of more current third wave treatments for anxiety disorders. And we care about that. Then journaling in traditional CBT often gets used to try to bring logic and reason to bear on highlighting why anxious thoughts are irrational, which they very well be. But in this situation, that's highlighted in thought records and CBT journaling for the purpose of trying to directly change them through thinking and cognition. And this doesn't work terribly well in the context of an actual anxiety disorder like panic disorder or health anxiety or OCD. It just doesn't work. And so in the beginning, we would try to say like, well, let's journal and use these sort of thought records and use sort of CBT methods to show you that your thoughts are irrational and not likely to be the catastrophe that you think. And then once you see that they're irrational, we can start to change them be simply because you see the irrationality. And we know that that led to higher relapse rates, attrition. Uh, it, there was legit complaints about CBT, trying to just change thoughts through logic and reason and Socratic questioning, where, yeah, it was the most effective treatment we had, but it, it often turned out to be not terribly effective on the long term because of that. So that's how journaling would be used in like sort of traditional or old school CBT. Uh, and it doesn't really work out that well, we had to put that acceptance and flexibility part into the into the puzzle. And we're going to get to that. So am I saying that like anxious people, people listening to this podcast or watching this video, if you're dealing with an anxiety disorder or chronic states of anxiety that you can't seem to get out from underneath, am I saying that we should ever, ever journal? Well, I'm not really saying that at all. I mean, if journaling is a thing that you enjoy doing, there's literally nothing wrong with that. We never want to take away things that are a source of strength or coping. But 
if your journal is traditional in, in its nature and you're journaling right now and your journal, if you look at the last few weeks or few months, sort of looks like a never ending, continuously looping episode of Stranger Things. And you've been like trying specifically to fix your anxiety through the act of journaling and it's not working out for you so well and you're getting really frustrated by that and you're starting to think that you're never going to get better, then it might be time to at least revisit the habit. Now, a recovered person, somebody who's gotten past that chronic or disordered state might return to more traditional forms of journaling, like as a personal history and introspection tool, which is cool. But a chronically anxious person might need to consider modifying their journaling style for a while. So if you already died in the world journaler and you love that, I'm not trying to take that away from you. But what I'm going to suggest today is that we may have to sort of shift gears and use journaling in a little bit of a different way for now until you can get out of the, you know, out of the weeds and out of the deep water, get your head above water, stand up, put out the fire. Then maybe you can go back to the sort of that old school way of journaling when it fits your context again. So if you are dealing with an anxiety disorder like panic disorder or OCD, OCD isn't technically in the anxiety disorder category anymore, but it's closely enough related. Agoraphobia, health anxiety, that sort of stuff, social anxiety. How can we use journaling? Like what are the top tips for anxiety disorder journaling? Well, the first one that I will give you would be use your journal as like a standing reminder. What I mean by that is it's totally cool to start every journal entry with a framing statement or a reminder. Like these could be prompts, but they're not really prompts. They're just reminders that you might have sort of automatically built into the top of every journal, journal entry. Some examples of those might be, I don't have to figure out or fix my feelings all the time. I might put a reminder in the beginning of every journal entry that says all thoughts are allowed. I don't have to control my thoughts, right? I might use one that says frightened bodies do frightened body things. And that's normal even when it's scary. So they wouldn't really be prompts. They'd be more like reminders at the top of every journal entry. And you could start to see how statements like that, framing statements, reminders can help you remember what your recovery framework kind of looks like before you fall into the trap of digging into thoughts and feelings and sensation with the purpose of sort of trying to solve them. So one tip for anxiety disorder journaling would be start your journal entries with those framing statements or those reminders. It's like prompts, but you don't really answer them. They're just reminders. So the next tip I would say is when you're sort of starting either starting to journal in the context of an anxiety disorder or modifying your journal journal habit to sort of fit your anxiety disorder recovery. One thing that I would say is you want to try and focus your journaling on four key things. The first one is what happened. That is, what did you feel or think or experience? What emotions did you experience as a result of that? And here's a hint or a spoiler alert. That will usually be fear, uncertainty, or feeling vulnerable. So just what did I experience? What actually happened? And what did I feel when this happened? Sometimes the feeling is exactly what happened, or sometimes the thought is the happening. That's okay. Just describe it. The second thing you want to focus on is what did you do in response to what happened? Either the sensation or the trigger in the world that set you off and made you anxious or the thought that you had or whatever it is. What did you do in response to that? In this situation, I would say, be specific. Did you do something specific behaviorally in response to that experience? Or did you do something specific mentally, like engage in active thinking or problem solving, or maybe fact checking or verifying to try and make yourself feel better? Just record that. What did I do behaviorally and mentally in response to this thing that happened that made me feel a certain way? The third thing you'd want to focus on in your journal entry would be how did things turn out? Like what was the outcome? Did your behavioral or mental response that you noted previously change anything? Did it make you feel better even just in the moment? And then the fourth thing, and this is probably the most important one to me is, is this a pattern? If you look back over the last few weeks or maybe even months in your journal, can you refine, can you find repeated entries and instances that look either identical or an awful lot like the one you're making right now? Is this recurring? And if it is, compare that to the outcome you recorded. 
if ruminating or actively worrying or going into escape or avoidance or saving mode made you feel better in that moment, then why does this keep happening? Notice that you keep writing the same journal entry again and again. Now it might be better than just recanting, you know, recounting a nightmare over and over, but if you're being very factual and sort of objective in this, and we're going to get to that in a second, why do you keep making the same general kind of entry? So look for patterns, right? You can use your sort of anxiety disorder or anxiety recovery journaling style to help you find repeating patterns because they matter. They, they are, they are clues. They are flags. They are, you know, maps for us to follow. And here's a pro tip when you're working on this, do not attempt to interpret what you put in your journal entry. Just stick to the facts. It's just the facts. So for instance, say just exactly what happened in your body, not what it felt like or what you thought it meant. Say what emotions you experienced. I was angry. I was afraid. I was frustrated. I was sad. I was very afraid will suffice. You don't need to add the part where it felt like you might pass out or die or make a scene or go insane or whatever it is you fear. We really want to be objective here to as great a degree as we can. So when we're journaling, I just want you to maybe focus on those four things and be as objective as possible without adding a story to it or your interpretations of what it felt like or what you were afraid might happen as a result. So the next tip I can give you sort of for anxiety disorder journaling would be in the next phase, once you sort of get this down and you start to record your experiences this way, subjectively without adding stories and without turning them into repeated like nightmarish digging for clues, then what can you change? Like this should lead us to like, well, what can I start to change? So if you're journaling, your anxiety disorder journaling is revealing sort of a repeating pattern of trigger, escape, avoid, repeat, then now it might be time to set up a bit of a new journal framework once you see that to help to change that. And that would be based on really three statements, which is I felt, I did, and then I wound up dot, dot, dot. And it's going to sound familiar to the things I just told you, right? But this is where I want things to get a little bit more descriptive, if you will, right? We want to record actual mental and behavioral action to build on a record you can rely on. And this is a part where we can start to bring a little bit more of those catastrophic interpretations back into the picture before reason. So let me give you an example. Today, I had thoughts about insanity again. I was really afraid again. It got so bad, it felt like I was going to snap and totally lose myself forever, which is my biggest fear. I was very worried that this experience would be too much that I'm too weak and it would break me permanently. I did, that's the second one, I did my best to allow all those thoughts without fighting them. I tried my best to relax my body and let it do whatever it thought it needed to do. But that was really hard. I slipped up a few times, I went back into fighting and resisting mode, and I, I really had to keep reminding myself of what to do. It was really hard, and this is a hard thing to do. And then I wound up, there's that third one, okay. Still afraid and worried, I'm still afraid and anxious now, but if I really look at this, I could see that I didn't take my usual sort of evasion, evasive or safety action. And I was able to move through those fears when they flared up throughout the day. So see the difference, like what I described is a very different journal entry than you might think of journaling on a traditional sense from like a wellness or mental health standpoint. Because now what we've made is like a useful record. So when you are convinced that you are making no progress, that you know nothing about recovery, that you're in a setback or that you're never going to get better, and these are common thoughts among anxious people, you can stop for a second and look back on these journal entries to inject some objective reality into that process. Could be really useful, right? So often, like in my work that I do in my social media community, I will get people who will ask me, or if you follow people who are like me, like Josh Fletcher, my podcast on Disordered, or Kim Quinlan, or Lauren Rosen, or whoever, you know, the usual suspects, Joanna Hardis, people might reach out to people like us to provide that. Oh, I'm in a setback, right? I'm, I'm just worried that I'm never going to get better. You know, what do I do with that, Drew? Well, here, if you journal this way and kind of use this sort of rough framework that I'm giving you, you don't even really have to ask me or Josh or Lauren or Joanna or Kim. You can look back at your own journal and see what's going on, right? It's way better than asking a third party that you don't even know. And it's way, way better than reading back through 104 entries, you know, dating back six months that all sound like the end of the world and ultimately give you zero credit 
for what is an important part of recovery. And that is sort of your innate, innate ability to be human and experience human things like fear or uncertainty or anxiety or even panic attacks, right? So think about that. What I'm, what I'm trying to give you here is a way to kind of change your journaling framework so that it can be truly useful to you and not just a fruitless, futile, like frantic attempt to try to fix your feelings and, and your sensations by writing and thinking and digging, right? Because that doesn't really work out so well. So now let's talk about journaling sort of going forward and as you progress. And that would be start to look a little different too, or it might. Now, this is where it gets really individual, right? But as you start to progress in your recovery, maybe you're finding that you're less reactive to your sensations or thoughts or emotions than you used to be. Maybe you don't feel that they are as continuously threatening or urgent as they used to be. That's good. These are signs of progress, right? You're kind of getting your life back. You might find in that situation that you're starting to experience emotions and thoughts again, like a non-anxious person might, like they can stand alone and then they might actually have value and you might be able to take actual useful action in response to those internal experience. So for example, as you're further down the road in recovery or you're a fully recovered person, when being really angry at your sister, for instance, because you had an argument is just being really angry about your sister. And it's no longer connected to catastrophic things like fearing a panic attack or worrying that you might go insane. You might be able to use your journal again in more of sort of a traditional way to explore that feeling or express it in a safe way. Maybe check out the situation that caused it. Think about that a little bit and maybe decide what you're going to do next to address it. You know, do I have to like change the way I relate to my sister if I'm angry at her? Or do I want to ask her to not be so rude to me next time? Or do I want to do nothing and just say, well, we had a fight because sometimes siblings fight. Like your journal might become useful again in that respect. That's the way non-anxious people often use journaling. And if you've always been a journaler in that traditional style, then like, congratulations, you're getting something that you love and have found useful in the past. You're getting it back again like pat yourself on the back for making some progress and being able to return to things that actually matter to you or make you happy or make you feel better or help you just better be better at life. And if you've never been a journal kind of person before you tried sort of this anxiety recovery journaling that I'm describing today, and you find that you have less need to make sort of the anxiety disorder entries that I'm describing in this podcast episode or this video, you might decide to explore traditional journaling to see how that fits into sort of your emerging recovery. I mean, you might like it, or you might find it totally useless. And one day when you aren't always afraid of your own body and mind anymore, you might make your very last anxiety disorder journal entry and never look back. That can happen. And that's fine, too. So this wouldn't necessarily be a framework that I'm giving you today for forever journaling. It's within a specific context. And then when you get out of this particular context and your life changes and your situation changes, you may choose to return to traditional journaling or try traditional journaling or burn your journals and never do it again. That's totally up to you. It's totally fine. There's no right answer there. So as we start to get like toward the end of the episode here, I want to talk about some criticisms of this because I know when you look at this stuff through the lens of general wellness or emotional support or mental health, personal growth, telling somebody to not fully describe and honor air quotes, their thoughts and emotions might seem ridiculous, or you might even feel like this is harmful. Like, what is this guy talking about? So if you stumble upon this video or this podcast episode, and you come from more traditional mental health or wellness circles, you might think, what is this guy talking about? How can he tell people to not actually get in touch with their feelings? And I really understand where that comes from. But I just have to simply remind you that in this podcast on this YouTube channel, I am addressing a very specific issue in context, chronic and disordered states of anxiety. This is its own animal, if you will. And the rules tend to get all thrown up in the air and get very counterintuitive in, in this context. So if you are aghast because you are certain that the key to recovery from panic disorder or say OCD, just for example, must lie in uncovering hidden pain or other highly emotionally introspective activities like traditional journaling where you're doing emotion dumps and, and uh, figuring out where it came from and what is this telling you? Well, then you are certainly free to disagree with me and, and move on if you want to. But just know that in very large populations of people that suffer from the kind of mental health issue that we're talking about here, that kind of thing is most times harmful rather than helpful. 
and really at a minimum, it winds up being for most of these people fruitless and frustrating. So we have to take the specific context into account. Nobody here, me, there's no one else here, it is just me. Nobody here is suggesting that we ignore emotions or feelings forever like robots, or just let the world like kick our butts in an entirely passive way forever. That's not what I'm saying. But we do have to recognize that when active resistance and like active mental and emotional problem solving goes off the rails and fuels the struggles we're addressing, when I blather into this microphone every two weeks, then we may have to actually change things up a little bit and start to think about how we might consider a different approach might. So just wanted to address that because I know that criticism will come up and it can be a valid criticism if taken out of context. So let's wrap it up. We're 25 minutes into it. It's a little longer than I wanted to go, but you guys know me by now. If you listen long enough, sometimes it kind of sounds like an episode like this is an anti journaling episode. I'm not anti anti journaling. I myself have been journaling very consistently for the last two or three years now. And I have actually come to love it. Like I write, I can't believe it. I write in a journal every morning, like write with a notebook and my silly little brass pen here. And I dig it, right? But the way that I journal now would not have been helpful or probably even possible back when I was in the thick of my anxiety and mental health issues. So I'm a big fan of journaling. And even when traditional journaling can be counterproductive to anxiety disorder recovery, I'm a fan of trying to adapt it like I've described here in this episode, and seeing if you can use it and if it would work for you. So consider using your journal to sort of put a bow on this one to number one, remind you of what recovery is all about to help you stay out of the rabbit hole of resistance and fixing and ruminating, right? That's like using those framing statements and those reminders. Use your journal to help you teach you how to objectively describe your experiences and recognizing repeating patterns that you want to break and change. And use your journal in this context to sort of keep a useful record of changes in action that are helping you break those maladaptive sort of restrictive rigid patterns that are having negative impact on your life. And you know, that's it. So that's all I'm talking about here. This is a way to take the journaling habit. And if your traditional journaling is helping you or keeping you stuck or frustrated, toss it and don't journal at all if you want, or if you want to continue to journal, you may think about changing to this sort of framework, or to be completely honest with you, some people do both. It's really okay to do both. As long as you have the ability to know when you're engaged in sort of healthy or useful introspection, and when you got to stick to your anxiety disorder journal and just do just the facts. So if you can do both of those things at the same time, and that works for you, and it's helping you then cool, like I'm a fan of doing that too. I just wanted to introduce sort of this new framework, either as a temporary substitute for potential journaling, or possibly side by side, if you think you can do that, there's nothing wrong with that. If you've never journaled before ever, and you want to try it, because you think it's sort of good for anxiety, I'm not telling you to journal to calm down. This is a way to help you kind of go through recovery based on the principles and the theoretical orientation that I'm always talking about here. So that was sort of my goal. I mean, I tried to squeeze a lot into like 28 or 30 minutes of a podcast episode. I hope I've been able to do that. And honestly, I've been sort of thinking lately about doing maybe a little journaling workshop that can help people walk through these ideas, practice them and get a little coaching on them. If you think that that might be helpful, then take a second and you can go to learn.theanxioustruth.com. That's where all my workshops and stuff are, but you can get on my mail list there. It's free. And you know, if I get around to creating a workshop like this on journaling, I will let you guys know on the mail list. Do not worry. I do not send spam. I mean, honestly, I could barely find the time to even do a monthly newsletter. So hawking like crazy stuff at you to get money from you is absolutely not part of what I do. I just thought that this might be helpful. And a few people have asked about a journaling workshop. So maybe I'll do that. Um, if you have any comments or questions on that, by all means, leave them in the comments on YouTube. Although I know I am like a month and a half behind on responding. I promise I'm going to circle back as soon as I can. I promise. Another way to leave feedback would be you can do that if you're listening to the podcast episode, just look at the first link at the very top of the podcast description, you could send me feedback via text, I won't see your number, I'm never going to text you back. It's totally anonymous, but it's a way to leave a comment or a question that way, which should be pretty convenient for most people. It's working out really well. And I'm going to use it to do a Q and ep Q and a episode probably in the next few episodes. So that is episode 302 of the anxious truth in the book. This is normally why I would put in closing music. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. We'll just see how much time I have for editing. Uh, thank you for listening, hanging out with me. I appreciate it. If you're watching on YouTube, consider subscribing to my channel. If you dig this, 
like the video, that definitely helps me leave a comment. I promise I will get back and check it out. If you're listening to the podcast on Apple podcasts or Spotify, maybe rate it four or five stars. If you dig it, if you really dig it, maybe take a second and write a little review that says why you dig it, because it helps more people find the podcast. That means more people get help. And that's why I do this to begin with. Uh, and just a quick reminder before we end, like try and wrap up every episode this way, no matter what you're doing today, if you could make some small change so that you move a little bit closer to living a life driven by what you value and what you want, and a little less based on fear and trying to fix how you feel by default all the time, then you are winning. Even if that is a very small, tiny little change, and even if you don't make that change tomorrow and you're a little bit inconsistent, as long as over time you can trend in that direction, then you are winning and you will get there. Every little step counts, every little change counts. Every time you get brave and challenge the assertion that you must fix your sensations, your symptoms, your thoughts, your emotions, then you are winning. You are learning from that if you let yourself learn from that. So thanks for hanging out. I hope you found today helpful in some way, shape, or form. I'll be back in two weeks with episode 303. Don't know what that's going to be about, but I will be here. Thanks a bunch for hanging out, and I will see you in the next one. We are out. <laughs>